Hey everyone, in this video, I wanna talk about what COIL does separate from what Dask does. If you've never used Dask before, go watch another video, there are tons online. In this video, I wanna talk just about the sort of institutional needs and the cloud infrastructure that COIL provides on top of Dask. COIL provides many features, we'll focus on six. Deployment, software and, environment and credential management, hardware and region flexibility, historical tracking, cost management, and cost optimization. We'll go through those really briefly. So if you're using Dask, you deploy it somehow. You might use the local cluster option, just running on a local, local machine, or you might use a project like Dask Kubernetes or Dask Gateway or Dask Job Queue or Dask Cloud Provider to deploy a Dask cluster. In principle, Coil does the same thing as those projects. Coil just, is just a way to get a Dask cluster. Uh, let's do that now. So I'm going to ask for 50 workers. Um, and I'll ask for, maybe that's it. I'm just going to do those things. So I just want 50 workers living somewhere I don't know where. We'll give more options in a second. And so at the very basic level, COIL is going to give me the cluster with 50 machines that I can connect to and leverage the same way to use any other DAS cluster. That's the primary thing that it does. But there's a lot of nuance to doing that well. Let's dig into that nuance. Nuance number one is software and credential management. Um, I'm not specifying the Docker image that I'm using. And instead, Coiled is looking at my local machine. It's noting all of the conda and pip packages that I have. It's noting also development packages, libraries that I have installed locally. And it is wrapping those up in a way that it can deploy on 50 Linux machines in the cloud. And it's doing that all dynamically at runtime. If I pip install a new package, that new package will show up the next time I create a cluster. Now it's deploying those machines for me. They've been provisioned. I'm now renting them from, in this case, Amazon. They're turning on, Ubuntu's turning on, and now they're starting to download those environments. Uh, so this is the first main feature that Coil provides on top of normal Dask deployment techniques. It's managing the software environment mismatch problem for you. If you have software locally on your Windows or Mac machine, it will give you something that looks very similar running remotely on a bunch of Linux machines in the cloud. It's also gonna move all of my um, local cloud credentials to those workers. On my machine, I've got like a .aws credentials file on my hard drive and it's gonna look at those credentials. It's going to generate some secure tokens that it can safely pass to those workers so that my workers can access any data that I can access myself locally, all in a safe and secure manner. And as a result, I can connect to that DAS cluster. Um, oh wait, I need to grab a client. So the coiled clusters operate just like any other DAS cluster object you'd create. They have all the same interfaces. And now I've got a fully secure DAS dashboard that I can connect to and you know, read, uh, read some remote data. And so again, this is just giving me the same interface that any DAS deployment technique would provide, uh, but it's just easy to use and it gives me a lot of bells and whistles on top. And again, the first two bells and whistles we saw were software and credential management. That's, that's really helpful. I didn't have to like build the Docker image and push a Docker image and deal with that. The second thing I wanna focus on is hardware and region flexibility. If you look at the coiled cluster constructor, there are a lot of very interesting options that you might wanna take a look at. Uh, let's go and play with a few of those. Maybe rather than 50 machines, I want, I want 100 machines. And I want those machines to have uh, you know, maybe, uh, let's say eight CPUs each. Uh, I've been interested in ARM recently. Uh, ARM chips just can be a lot more efficient than Intel chips, it turns out. Um, let's see what else we want to do. My data is living in region US East 1. Let's go and make sure that I'm in that region as well. If you're using a te technology like Kubernetes, you've got to deploy a new Kubernetes cluster in this region with a node pool attached to a certain node type that has these kinds of machines in it, it can be kind of daunting. With Coiled, we can very dynamically spin up any machine type in any region, in either AWS or GCP, uh, totally on the fly. It's really powerful if you've got it, if you want to sort of play with architecture. 
Mm, is there any other hardware things I want to try out? Let's just leave that as is. So I'm making a totally new cluster and Quota is going to do its thing again. And it's going to again give me a cluster in about two minutes. So this is sort of the, the next main feature that Coil provides is a lot of flexibility around the infrastructure that you're playing with. Uh, let's go on to advantage number four. Let's go look at historical tracking. So if I go to cloud.coil.io, I can see the activity in my team. So here we see actually the two clusters I've made. Right, so this is the one that's scaling, and then this is the one that is uh, not yet ready. Let's actually, or this one that we were playing with before. Let's actually turn this off, right? We're not using this one anymore. It'll turn itself off after about 20 minutes if it realizes we've been inactive. But we can go and clean it up anyway. We've got the full visibility here. I can also see the activity of everyone else in my team, right? So it looks like James, my colleague, J.R. Borbeau, has made a lot of clusters. Had done zero work recently. I need to go talk to him about that. And I can see a lot of historical activity. Uh, you might notice these uh, flags here on the right. They're flagging interesting aspects about workloads that I might see. So this workload, you know, touched some disk. It was pretty network heavy. Also idling. Who was that jerk who was idling? Ooh, that was me. Whoops. Um, and I can go look through again my team and see, ooh, it looks like Miles is running into a, an error. I can go and see what Miles was working on. Uh, and I can see the code that he was running, the exceptions that he ran into. Uh, and I can also take a look at metrics over time. Uh, and so this lets us play pretty deeply with how our team is performing and lets us optimize not just our own workloads, but also those of our colleagues who might not be quite as familiar uh, with the code base as we are. Uh, what we often find is there's usually like a couple of very smart task users in every team, and they're sharing a lot of their expertise with their colleagues. And some of this, some of this uh, reporting can really help. So what did I have up next? Cost management. Speaking of those colleagues who need a lot of help, um, sometimes they do wrong things. So uh, we've got team management. And I've got various people on my team. And I might say, you know, James, the guy who we noticed before, who was maybe creating a lot of clusters and weren't doing anything, let's limit his, uh, his ability to do damage, right? Maybe James can only run with 1,000 CPU cores concurrently. And you know, on a monthly basis, let's limit him to you know, maybe 20,000 CPU hours. That's you know, at sort of maximum cost. That's usually about $1,000. Great, I've just limited James's exposure or my exposure to James being uh, unreliable. If I want to, it's also very easy just to add people to my team. Uh, anybody can log in with GitHub or, or G Suite connections or make your own username and password. You can invite members of your team and kind of manage them nicely. You can also do things like look at how much your team is spending. You know, it looks like James and Miles and I are doing a lot of the work these days on this account. I can go to other teams and see how other, uh, how other teams are managing and how much they're spending, right? This is the benchmark account. We do a lot of uh, testing with Dask on Coiled on an on a hourly or daily basis. So there's a lot of cost management and sort of team management that you can do in Coiled which a lot of people need when they are supporting not just themselves, but new users in a group, and they sort of need to keep costs constrained. Um, the last thing I'll mention is cost optimization. So Coil does a bunch of different things to optimize costs. We make sure that your network costs are minimized, we're choosing the right instances for you. We're helping you use things like ARM. Um, one of my other favorite cost optimizations is Spot. Uh, I think there's a yeah, so compute purchase option. Uh, by default, we use on-demand instances to make sure things go, don't go down. But if you want to, it's very easy just to select spot instances. And again, just like with everything else, it's really, um, it's easy to experiment, see what works and what doesn't work. With a lot of these cost-cutting measures, what we found is that there's a lot of importance in the nuance of how you implement these things. For example, we found that spot actually isn't very popular. What's actually much more popular is spot with fallback. Let me just briefly give this as an example to show you the kind of nuance that we do in setting up cloud infrastructure. What we found is that when you use just spot instances, things go down and things go a little bit unstable, and many users don't want that. They're actually willing to pay full price in order to avoid that. What we do instead with spot with fallback is we look at your region, 
We select the data center in that region that at that time has the most spot availability. There's different data centers which have varying levels of availability. Then if you ask for say a thousand machines and there are only 800 machines available for you, we'll backfill with 200 on-demand instances to make sure you get that 1,000 machines total. As your spot instances go away, we've got two minutes. And in those two minutes, we move data off your spot instances, we bring up new on-demand instances, and everything usually proceeds smoothly. This is again the kind of example of the kind of nuance, kind of engineering that we do to uh, make everything smooth, to give you abilities like using Spot and the cost efficiencies that come with that, uh, while still having a good, smooth user experience. Uh, there are many other things I could talk to you about ways we cut costs. If you go to the Coil blog, uh, there's lots of other similar things we can start playing around with. So that's it. I wanted to briefly show uh, what Coil does that's separate from Dask. And I went through again these things, right? Deployment, software and credential forwarding, hardware and region flexibility, historical tracking, cost management, cost optimization. There's a bunch more stuff inside of Coiled. In general, it's a really smooth experience for users and it's a really robust and secure experience for organizations. Uh, hopefully this is useful for you all. I'll just end by saying that uh, we, we don't charge anything for your first 10,000 CPU hours per month. You still have to pay your cloud, but most of our users don't pay us any money. Uh, most users are, are operate very comfortably underneath that sort of 10,000 CPU hours per month level. Uh, if you're using something like Dask Cloud Provider, Dask Kubernetes, Dask Gateway, it could be that Coil is a better experience for you these days. Uh, I'll bet we could reduce your overall cloud costs. So that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Cheers.